Thank you. Be seated. Good to, be, good to be with you this morning, good to worship with you. Let me ask you to do a couple of things. First of all, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. And uh, if you want to follow along there, you can. And then also we'll have the scripture on the screen. Then secondly, I want to encourage you to take out your message notes that look like this. They were handed to you when you came in inside your bulletin. And uh, that also will help you to... Stay with us and follow along with us this morning. We began a new series a couple of weeks ago talking about what to do when we find ourselves in a season of our life where God seems to be inattentive, uh, uncooperative, or late. And I think most of us have, have probably experienced those times, even if we, we're not real comfortable maybe talking about it to other people. You know, those times where we're throwing up prayers and, and God doesn't seem to really be paying any attention whatsoever. And, and quite honestly, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And you know, that can be very frustrating, very disheartening, very confusing. And a lot of times, it seems like the hardest thing is, we're typically not even asking for the moon, right? Uh, it, I, God, I'm not asking you to make me rich. I'm just asking for a job. God, I'm, I'm not demanding a brand new car. I just need transportation. God, I'm not asking you to give me perfect health. I'm just asking you to, to let me be comfortable enough to sleep through the night. And so it can be very frustrating. It can be confusing when we're asking God for what seems to us to be very reasonable answers to prayer. But He's not answering. And one of the things that, that makes this even more difficult is when you're in a season of your life like this and you look around you and everybody else seems to be just doing fine. Do you ever notice that? Do you ever notice that in the hardest times, it's when you'll look around and you'll notice that people seem to be doing really, really well. You'll look around and, and people who, who you know, you, you look at and you think, well, that, they're not even, uh, that's not even a great person. And look at how good they're doing. Their lives are good. They're, they don't, they, you know, they don't care about God. They're not interested in, in what's going on for God. They don't even ask God for help. Things just sort of happen for them. And here you are, and you're, all you're asking for is average. All you're asking for is the minimum. And, and again, it's, it's not just days or weeks. For some of you, it's seasons where God just seems inattentive, uncooperative, or even late. Maybe you're in the middle of that right now. Maybe there's something going on in your marriage, or there's a health issue with somebody that you love or care about, or there's a, a job thing, or a school thing, or a future thing, and it makes you think, you know, if there, if there really is a God, why wouldn't God answer my prayer? And if you go through enough of those seasons in life, you'll find yourself from time to time having doubts about what's going on with God. And not just doubts about the character or the power or the goodness of God, but, but sometimes even about the existence of God. And so before we jump into the meat uh, of what we're going to talk about today, I want to make a statement about that. Because for some of you, it's going to be hard to get over that hurdle first. So let me make this statement and, and, and let me kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about today. God's lack of cooperation is not an argument for or against His existence. Now, I, I need you to hear that, and I need you to understand what I'm saying. God's lack of cooperation in your life is not an argument for or against His existence. And that's a big deal. That's a legitimate thing to address. Because emotionally, this seems like a good argument, right? Well, because of how I feel, and you know, it's been so long since I've heard from God, and He seems so inattentive in my life, it's hard not to emotionally make the leap to assume, well, you know, there must not be a God if He's not going to even answer me. But, but understand, there's no rational correlation between whether or not God cooperates with you and whether or not God exists. And again, I know it's sort of a natural conclusion to jump to, but if you really stop and put some thought into it, it's not a rational conclusion. Look, if, if lack of cooperation were proof that someone didn't exist, there would be segments of my life where I would be convinced that my children don't exist. Okay? Right? If lack of cooperation prove that someone doesn't exist, my wife would have seasons in her life where she would walk around going, I don't have a husband. There is, there is no husband, right? 
But that's not how it works. Why? Because a lack of cooperation doesn't prove that someone doesn't exist. But, but, when you're in a season where God is silent, where God appears to be absent, it's easy to draw that conclusion that God is not there. Maybe you grew up in a faith or a background where you were taught, if you just have enough faith, God is going to answer your prayer the way you want Him to. And so you have a need. Uh, you've got a legitimate need. You honestly and sincerely pray and nothing happens. So what are you to reasonably conclude? Either there is something wrong with me, right? Or, or there is something wrong with the God that I prayed to. It's got to be one or the other. It just makes sense. Or maybe you grew up in a church where if it was, you know, if you'll give more, God will honor and bless you. If you'll just serve more, God will honor and bless you. If you'll just show up more and have more perfect attendance, God will honor and bless you. And so again, when things aren't going well, when God seems inattentive to you, first you look in the mirror and you say, what's wrong with me? What, what, have, what have I done wrong? Why doesn't God love me or like me anymore? Then you look to God and you say, what's wrong with a God who won't respond to a person He says that He loves? I mean, it makes me wonder if He's even there at all. And so the reason that we're doing this series is because throughout the Old and New Testament, there are people, men and women, that God clearly loved. He obviously loved. But if you were to drop into certain segments of their life, certain chapters of their life, you would come to the conclusion that God was completely inattentive, uncooperative, and late showing up in their life. Even though when we back out and take the big picture view of their life, it's a 100% obvious that that was not the case. And so what I've been trying to show you is that your personal life circumstances do not coincide with how God feels about you. And you do not want your faith to hinge on what has God done or not done for you lately. Now in week one we talked about the Israelites, if you guys remember, coming up against the uh, an impossible situation, the Red Sea in front of them, the Egyptian army behind them. Last week we looked at the story of John the Baptist and how he suffered with doubts about Jesus because he didn't seem to, Jesus didn't seem to be paying any attention when John in prison needed him the most. Now today we're going to talk about another man from the New Testament. And if you grew up in church, you'll probably be familiar with his name, but you may not be familiar with all of his story. He's introduced to us in the New Testament as Saul. And then later we come to know him as what? His name was changed to? To Paul. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, he was a very important guy in the New Testament. He was the guy who took the gospel of Jesus, the story of Jesus, outside of Jerusalem, out into Judea, and began to spread it all over the world. Paul spent the last 20 years of his adult life getting on ships and traveling around the Mediterranean Rim in, into very uh, hostile environments, introducing this idea that God had done something very unique in the world by sending Jesus into the world to die for the sins of mankind. Paul, he had all kinds of things happen to him. He was shipwrecked, he was beat up, he was stoned, he was put in prison, uh, he was snake bit, he almost drowned. I mean, every single day with Paul apparently was an adventure. And clearly God knew his name. God had called Paul into this very specific task. God did miracles through the Apostle Paul. And again, for 20 years, Paul did nothing but serve God as faithfully as he possibly could. At some point in his ministry, however, Paul faced a difficulty. He was stricken with what the Bible calls an affliction. And, and it was such a big deal that it made it very difficult for him to do the very thing that God had specifically called him to do. And when Paul realized how much that was going to impact his life and his ability to fulfill his mission in life, he did what every single one of us would do. He began to ask God to remove that thing from his life. And incredibly, God's answer to Paul was, No. No. It doesn't matter how much faith you have. It doesn't matter how long you pray. It doesn't matter how obedient you are. It doesn't matter what you promise or how well you bargain with me. The answer to this one, Paul, Paul who I love, who, who people are going to name their kids after, who some of the, the greatest buildings in the world will have your name on them, Paul who wrote uh, over half of the New Testament, the answer to your request is... No. He said, no. 
Now, well, let me tell you, if we just stop the message right there, and I'm, I'm tempted to, and you, you may be thinking, that is a good idea, right? <laughs> if we stopped right there, that should come as incredible encouragement to us all. Now, you may say, well, what? I mean, that's, no, that's not encouraging at all that God said no. No, but it is. It is encouraging. Let me tell you why. Because we find ourselves in moments where we wonder if God even knows our name. Does, does God even know we exist? Does God even care about what's going on in, in my life? And listen, God wants you to know, one of the men that He used more than any other man in human history next to Jesus, God said to him, No. No. But, but, but. He didn't just say no. Okay? Sometimes we act like that's the end of the story, but it's not. God said no, but in addition to saying no, God promised Paul something that God also promises you, and He promises me. This is 2 Corinthians 12 is where we're going to be. We're going to kind of drop in the middle of this conversation. So let me tell you first what's going on. The book of 2 Corinthians is a letter to the, that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in the city of Corinth that he had helped to start. And in this letter, Paul is describing to them his experience. He's basically telling his story. And as part of his story, he says that God has revealed such amazing things to him to share with the rest of the church and the rest of Christianity that in order to keep him humble, that God had allowed him to experience this affliction that I mentioned earlier. And in sharing this story, he gives us an insight into what we can expect when God says no to us. 2 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 7. Here's what he says. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Now, many of you have used that phrase for years and years to describe a, a boss or a brother-in-law or a nosy neighbor or a biology teacher, and you had no idea you were quoting Scripture, did you? Right? It turns out you are much more godly than you even realized. Because anybody can quote Scripture on purpose, but how godly do you have to be to quote Scripture without even realizing it, right? I mean, it, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good deal. Well, that's where, that's where this came from, this idea of a thorn in the flesh, something that, that just it bugs you and bothers you and slows you down and drives you a little bit crazy and, and you just can't stand it. And what Paul means by this is a, a thorn in the flesh, some kind of an affliction, an illness, an ailment, a disability that Paul had to deal with every day of his life. Now, I think it's interesting that Paul never tells us what that affliction was. It, throughout the Bible, read the whole New Testament, you're not going to know really what it was. And, and I think that probably means one of two things. Either this affliction was so obvious and so apparent that the people Paul was writing to knew exactly what he was already talking about without him even having to say it. It, it just literally went without saying. I think that's one possibility. Or, or he didn't want the affliction to be the focal point of his message. Does that make sense? Like he didn't want everybody focused on the affliction. He had something more important to say. Now, uh, unfortunately, the problem is, what are people going to do the moment you decide not to tell them what the affliction is? They're going to immediately try to figure out what the affliction is, right? And, and for a couple of thousand years, that's just what historians and biblical scholars have tried to do. But to this day, nobody knows. We just don't have any way to know exactly what that thorn in the flesh was for Paul. Uh, it could have been a speech impediment like Moses had. It could have been an illness that Paul contracted during his travels. We just have no idea. But, but while Paul didn't tell us what it was... He left no doubt as to how serious he felt it was and how much it affected his life. Look at how he describes it, verse 7. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, again, we don't know if Paul meant this literally or figuratively. Uh, have you ever said something like, yeah, you know, we had the vacation from hell? Or, or yeah, that, that, that guy was the teacher from hell. We don't know if, if Paul meant it like that. Or if he literally meant this was something that Satan was allowed to torment with him actively. But one way or the other, he makes it clear that he was in torment. And he was, a, he, he was struggling with this thing. Every time he went on a, a missionary trip, every time he got on a ship, every time he got up to speak, this was a constant torment to him. Now imagine, imagine this. This is a guy who has been specifically called by God to do the most important thing that anybody could be doing at that moment in human history. 
So really, what he was saying was, God, all I'm asking you to do is what I've already seen you do for other people. Heal me. God, I'm asking you to do what I have done for other people. Do you realize the Apostle Paul performed miracles? He did. In fact, most people don't realize this, but Paul actually raised a boy from the dead one time. It's true. Look it up. Acts chapter 20, uh, somewhere around verse 12. Uh, try not to pay attention to the fact that the reason the boy died is that Paul was preaching a sermon. The, it was so boring that the boy was sitting in a window. He fell asleep, fell out of the window, onto the ground and died. And Paul had to raise him from the dead. Now, i got to tell you, I'll be honest with you. Thank goodness we don't have two stories here. <laughs> Because it's unlikely, all right, that I'm going to be able to bring you back. I'm just saying. So you might want to, might want to pay attention and, and, and stay away. But that, that's a true story. Look it up. Acts chapter 20. And, and understand that Paul did some incredible things. He did things with God's power working with him. So it's not like Paul was asking God for something that he didn't already know God was completely capable of doing. And here's what he says, verse 8. He says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Now, you've got to understand that, that in the Greek, this is not like, well, you know, I prayed on Monday and I asked for healing, and, and then I prayed again on Tuesday, and then I skipped Wednesday because I was really busy that day, and then I prayed one more time on Thursday to be healed, and then I gave up. I prayed three times, I asked God to heal me, and then that was it. No, 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 that's not what, that's not what it says. These were what we call seasons of prayer, and they may have lasted years and years at a time for Paul. In other words, you know, I prayed for healing in my 20s, until I got to a point where I just almost quit hoping. But then when I was 37, I began to pray again for years that I'd be healed. And then all throughout my 40s, there wasn't a day go by that I didn't bring this to God and ask Him to take this away from me. He says three times, in three different times, in three different seasons of my life, I pleaded with God, I begged God to take this thing away from me. And, and just think for a moment about the bargaining power that the Apostle Paul would have had with God, right? I mean, if anybody was going to be able to bargain their way into a healing, it should have been the Apostle Paul. You know how you bargain with God? God, I'll, I'll go to both Easter services, right? God, I will, I will sign up to work in the nursery. You know what I know about people who sign up to work in the nursery? They went into heaven really bad, right? They, they, that, that, that's Oh, I know what your motivation is. I will do, it, it, God, if you'll do this for me, I promise you I will do this thing for you. Well, if we try to do that, imagine the credibility that Paul must have had with God. Three times he pleaded with him to take this pain away, take this torment away, take this thorn away. And again, if we stopped right there, isn't that kind of encouraging to you? I mean, it's not like we're glad that somebody is suffering. But doesn't it help to know that this was someone who God absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, knew His name, had done incredible things in Him, and yet God had said, no. He goes on in verse 9, and, and here's where maybe the Apostle Paul has a little bit of an advantage over us. Okay, Because I think for most of us, we would be satisfied if, if we could just hear something from God. Right? Even no might be encouraging because no means at least God knows you're alive. At least God heard your prayer. Uh, at least God is aware that you are in need. Just to hear anything at all from God would be an encouragement. Uh, one of the frustrations for us a lot of times is that we pray and we pray and we pray and we ask and we ask and we bargain and we beg and we promise and then we hear what? Nothing. We hear nothing. But in Paul's case, he actually got an answer. And even though you may never get an answer just exactly like the Apostle Paul did, I am 100% positive that God's answer to the Apostle Paul is also available to you. In fact, I'll go a step further. I believe that when God answered Paul, He was answering you and me 2,000 years in advance. That's how big God is. And the reason I know that is not only because of what Scripture teaches, and it's not simply from personal experience, but, but in being a pastor over the years, I have met dozens and dozens and dozens of people who would be able to identify with what God promised the Apostle Paul next, as Paul finishes up another season of pleading with God to take away this pain. This is verse 9. Here's what he says. But he said to me, God said to me, My grace is sufficient. For you. Now, think about that. That is an incredibly important statement. 
I, pe I begged him. I pleaded with him. I asked him. I knew that he's capable of doing it. I know that I've got a very important job to do. I need to be at my best so I can glorify Him as well as I possibly can. And so I went to Him and I asked Him to take it away. But He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. No, Paul. I'm not going to give you what you're asking for. But my grace is sufficient for you. No, I'm not going to give you what you absolutely believe you need. But my grace is sufficient for you. You're going to have to go through another season of your life dealing with this. But my grace is sufficient for you. Now, what exactly does that mean? What, what is this grace that, that God says is sufficient? Well, grace in this context is the ability... You know what? It's just the ability to put one foot in front of the other, isn't it? Grace is the ability to get up and get through another day. Grace is the ability to go to work and endure it one more time. Grace is the ability to come home to the unknown one more evening. Grace is the ability to keep on going in spite of the fact that nothing around you has changed. You've prayed and you've prayed and you've explained to God what would be best and how you believe things should work out and not one thing in your circumstance has changed and yet you are still able to keep on. It's the ability to find strength, to find the faith, to keep moving in the direction that God would have you to go. And so God says to the Apostle Paul, whom he loved, no, I am not going to remove this physical problem, but I will tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the strength to keep moving forward. Why? Because my grace is sufficient for you. And then look at this. Look at this next statement. For my power is made perfect in weakness. That is, my power is complete, mature. Uh, it comes to full fruition in your weakness. Now, see, none of us would sign up for that. Right? That, that's not what we sign up for. We, we don't sign up for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Here's what we sign up for. We want to be the guy standing in the end zone with a football under one arm and our finger pointed in the air giving God the glory as we score a touchdown. Correct? Men, that's what we want to be. Right? That's how we want to give God glory. We are all about giving God glory. But we don't want to be the guy that God leverages His glory out of weakness. We want to be the guy that God leverages His glory out of talent, out of success, out of opportunity, out of strength, out of our blessings. Now, am I wrong about this? Or am I right? That's what we want. We want to be the lady who wins Best Actress Award. Up there at the podium, holding our trophy, you know, saying, I, I want to thank the director, I, I want to thank all of my cast, I, I want to thank my family, and, and last but not least, I want to thank my, my Father in Heaven, because if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be here right now. And everybody, you know, everybody just applauds, and, and your husband or your wife, they're so proud, you know, they're looking at you. And, I mean, we want God to get glory, but we want God to get glory by leveraging our success. Not our weakness. And let me tell you something, by the way. I love it when famous people, successful people, give glory to God. I love that. It warms my heart to see that. It makes me shake my head and go, yeah. I, I, and I want to be one of those people, don't you? I want to be that guy. God leveraged my success. God put me in the spotlight, and I promise you, I will give you all of the glory. I, I will give everything to you. And you know what? God does that sometimes, doesn't He? But sometimes God says, no. No, I'm, I'm not going to leverage your success. I'm not going to leverage your skill, your opportunity. I'm not going to leverage your strength. I'm not going to leverage your talent. I'm not going to leverage your discipline. This time, I'm going to leverage your weakness. I'm going to leverage your inability. I'm going to leverage your lack of opportunity. I'm going to leverage what some people would consider to be your failure. I'm going to get glory from you. But I'm going to do it on the stage of your weakness, not your strength. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made complete in your weakness. That's tough, isn't it? That's, again, that's not exactly what you find 
on the, the, you know, the encouragement card at, at Mardell. That's not the story that we necessarily want to tell or to be told. Now, let me tell you what the good news is in this. And, and let's see if you can identify with it. I believe the good news is, is we don't get to choose. Right? Because we'd, we'd all be in trouble if we got to choose. We don't get to choose what God leverages for His glory. Because honestly, we wouldn't choose this. But let me ask you something. Isn't it true, when you're a Christian, and you meet another Christian that has a life circumstance that, that makes you shudder, a, a circumstance that makes you walk away going, God, I am so glad that's not me. A, a circumstance that makes you think, I, I have no idea how I would deal with that in my life. That would be beyond my ability to endure. But then you meet somebody in that situation, and somehow they have peace. You know what I'm talking about? And if you talk to them long enough, eventually you'll get this out of them. They'll say, you know what? His grace is sufficient for me. Isn't it true that when you meet somebody like that, those are the people who make the biggest impact on your faith? Much more than the guy in the end zone. Much more than the lady on the stage holding the, the, the trophy. Isn't it true that the people who just multiply our faith on a whole new level are the people who God has chosen to showcase their, His strength in their weakness? Do you see that? And how, how true that is? Aren't those the people who make you shake your head and, and go, you know what, there has to be a God. There's no other explanation for what I see in their response to the pain that they're going through, or the difficulty they're going through, or the hard times that they're going through. So here's a heads up if, if this is in your future. And here's an explanation if this is in your past. And here's some comfort if, if this is in your present. All right, God will, God has, God is going to showcase His strength in our weakness if, if we will learn to take no for an answer. If we will learn to take no for an answer. And hear me, it has zero to do with His love for you. It's got nothing to do with how He feels about you. Nothing to do with His compassion towards you. Nothing to do with whether or not He is present in your life. In fact, let me go so far as to say this. His strength in your weakness is His presence in your life. That's how you know He is right there with you. Paul goes on in verse 9. He says this, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong." You ever met anybody like that? Huh? You ever met anybody? Aren't they the most incredible, impactful, take-your-breath-away Christians that you've ever met? I, I spent some time with a lady this week who has what the doctors tell her is terminal cancer. She's on her second go-around with, with cancer. And the doctors have said, look, you know, we can, maybe we can prolong your life a little bit with this treatment, but... It's going to be hard, it's, it's going to be bad, and honestly, it's just not going to do that much. And she tried it. She said, I'm going to try it. I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to see how I do. She tried it. She couldn't do it. And she knows that, that her time is in all likelihood limited. And I sat down with her this week, and this is the first time I really had to, the opportunity to really sit and talk with her and and, and honestly, you know, I didn't know what to expect. It's, I mean, you can imagine, it's kind of intimidating to sit down with somebody and, and you're hoping to maybe bring a little bit of comfort to them and maybe somehow, um, you know, with, with some humility, maybe there's a way to encourage them just a little bit. And I sat down with her and, and I said, just kind of tell me where you're at. Tell me, tell me what's going on in, in your brain. And she said, you know the thing I'm dealing with? You know what I'm struggling with? My family just doesn't get what I'm going through. And I, you know, and stupid me, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I can, you know, well, I can really imagine that. And she says, no, 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 I, I don't mean they, they can't relate to my suffering. I mean, 
they don't understand why I'm so happy. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? She said, I, I keep trying to tell them. I know you love me. And I know you want me to be alive more than anything in the world, but you've got to understand something. If I can't live, I can't wait to die. If I can't be alive with you, then the next best thing is to be with God. And I'll be with, with, with people who I love and I miss and they've gone before me and I get to be with them and then someday I'm going to get to be with you again. And She said, I just I can't explain it to them and they don't get it, they don't understand it. And I said, you know, there's a scripture, there's a place in the Bible where the Apostle Paul says, to live is Christ. You guys remember this? To live is Christ, but to die is gain. And she says, that's it. Yes, yes, yes. What is that verse? I've got to write that down. What? That's it. That's it. To live is Christ. It's incredible. It's, it's valuable. It's, it's so important. To live is Christ. But to die is even better. She said, my, my kids, my, my, my husband, my family, they, they just don't get it. You know what? I don't get it either, do you? But I tell you what I do get. I get that I walked away from that conversation after about an hour and a half, and I'm like, God, my faith is... And her faith is big. And your, your, your strength is made complete in her weakness. You ever meet anybody like that? that just multiplies your faith, just takes it to a whole nother level? You know, sometimes God says no. But when He says no, He also says yes. You realize that? No, I'm not going to change your circumstances. No, I'm not going to fix that for you. No, I'm not going to force Him or first force her to change her mind. You know, I'm not going to do that. But in the meantime... While you wait, and while you pray, while I'm working on them through other people and through their own circumstances, in the meantime, my grace is sufficient for you. Several quick things to, to kind of finish this up. I, I want to just throw some thoughts at you, and, and, and basically this is kind of what I take from, from what Paul has said here. A couple of takeaways. Here's the first one. Takeaway one, we have permission to ask God to remove our thorns. We have permission to ask God to remove our thorns. Would you agree with me? That is good news. Yes? Listen to me. It is not a lack of faith to ask God to remove your thorn, okay? You need to know that. The Bible says that sometimes we, we have not because we don't ask. It is okay for you to ask God to remove your thorn. You have permission to ask God to remove your thorn. But here's the second thing you need to understand. God has permission to say no. You see, that's what making Him the Lord of your life is. Remember when you were a teenager or a young adult or maybe it was last week and, and you were coming to Christ and you made a decision to accept Christ into your heart and to live for Him and to, and to trust Him and you were going to go to heaven when you die and there was that whole thing about I'm going to make Him the Lord of my life and you're like, I really have no idea what that means. I mean, what is that? I don't refer to anybody else in my life as Lord except Downton Abbey, correct? This is what it means. To make someone Lord is to say, I give you permission to say no to me. I willingly submit to your will instead of mine. You have permission to ask God to remove your thorn. But you need to understand, as a Christian, you have given God permission to say no. Here's number three. God may choose to showcase His power on the stage of our weaknesses. That's something we need to accept. That's something we need to understand. In other words, your circumstances, your thorn may never change. 
And some things may never get better. Some things may never work out. Some things may never be healed. Some things may never come back together. And that is not a reflection of God's concern or lack of concern for you. It is His opportunity to showcase His strength in the midst of your weakness. Let me just say this, and, and this, this isn't in my notes, alright? This is for free. You get this extra today, alright? Second service, they probably will not get this, alright? I, I mentioned, I've referenced this each week because I think it's important to understand that, that uh, the fact that things may not get healed and they may not get right the way you want them to be, that's not a reflection of how God feels about you. Can that be a reflection of some poor choices in your life, yes or no? Yes or no? Yeah, absolutely. Can that be a reflection of some sin that you've committed in your life? Absolutely. Can that be a reflection of somebody else's sin that you had no control over? Yes or no? Can that be a reflection of God's plan and God's will in your life? Yes or no? Yes, it absolutely can. Alright, we need to know that. But it is not a reflection of how God loves us or how He feels about us. And here's the other thing. And, and, and when it comes to a thorn, you know, maybe we automatically think of something physical, something health-wise. It's not always that. But I, I just want to say this too. I just want to remind you of this. Maybe you've heard me say it before. This is not heaven. Okay? One day we will have bodies that don't get thorns. Amen? I was talking to somebody before the service. One day we will have bodies that do not have arthritis. Amen? We will have bodies that don't get fat. Amen. We, you know, I mean, there, 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 there's going to be a good day, a great day, and, and we are going to celebrate it and we're going to love it, but understand, this ain't it. Okay? And part of the thing is, is that we may have a thorn in our flesh physically, partially because we live on earth, not on heaven. And, and these bodies we live in, the Bible says they are nothing more than jars of clay. And there is no promise that this body is supposed to live forever. And that this body is going to be healthy forever. And so we need to understand that. Why am I sick? Why do I have this illness? Why do I have this thing? Why am I struggling with this thorn? It, it could be partially, the answer could be partially, because I am a human living in a human body, living on planet earth. Are you with me? And we need to get that, but we also need to get that God incredibly, He can still use that. He can still take it. He can still use it for His glory. Here's number four. You cannot experience God's sustaining grace while resisting His will. Now, that, here's the rub for us. All right, Because resisting God's will is understandable from a human perspective, isn't it? Come on, let's be real. Resisting God's will in certain circumstances, in certain cases in our life, makes perfect human sense. Every single one of us in this room can probably think of examples in our lives or the lives of people we know uh, of times when no one would blame us for resisting God's will. We've recently had a couple of, of men in our church who lost their wives. No one in their right mind would look at them and blame them for resisting God's will in that situation, right? That is just not going to happen. That's not going to be a thought that's going to go through our mind. We have several people in our church who are going through cancer right now. Some for the second, third time in their life. No one would ever blame them for resisting God's will if, 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 if they asked God to heal them and, and God said no. None of us would look at them and say, well, you know, you're just a terrible person. We would not say that. We would not think that. The problem is, the problem is, the thing that they need more than anything is what? God's sustaining grace. And yet you cannot experience God's sustaining grace when you're resisting His will. And so the very thing that, that is so understandable is the very thing that can keep you from experiencing the very thing you need more than anything else. And, and here's what happens when we resist God's will, whether our situation is big like cancer or small like something else. You'll still be a Christian. All right, Christians can absolutely resist God's will. You'll still be a Christian, but you'll be an angry Christian. Or a frustrated Christian. Maybe a bitter Christian. You can't get away from being a Christian, but you won't benefit from it. 
You'll never experience the sustaining grace of God as long as you're unwilling to take no for an answer. Now, maybe you say, okay, 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 okay. You, I'm convinced. You got me. What, what do I do? All right, what, what comes next? How do I do this? How do I experience this in my life? It's this. Here's number five. Sustaining grace begins with not my will, but yours. Pointing this way, right? Not my will, but yours. Sustaining grace begins with a prayer that, that Jesus Himself prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. When He basically said, God, I don't want to have to drink from this cup. I don't want to have to die. I don't want to have to be crucified. Here's what I want. Here's what I don't want. Here's what I'd like you to do. But, now that you know what I want, not my will be done, but your will be done in my life. And I'm telling you, listen to me, I'm telling you, into the gap between what I want and what God has decided to do or not do, into the gap goes sufficient, sustaining, empowering grace. But hear me. You'll never experience it as long as you're resisting His will. It begins when we say, this is what you've chosen for me, God. Not my will, but yours be done. I'm trusting you for strength. And I'm trusting you for grace in my weakness. Will you bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, I just... I just want to lift up those who are here today and they're just in the middle of, of that thing with that thorn, whatever it may be. It may be something physical, emotional, spiritual. Uh, it could be a lot of different things, God. And, and, and a lot of times I know that people are sitting here with a thorn in their flesh and nobody even knows it. They, they're dressed up real nice and they, they have a pretty smile and everything seems okay. But God, on the inside, they're not okay. God, I certainly can relate to that. I've certainly been in that place. But what you've taught me is that your grace is sufficient for me. That you don't mind one bit if I come and I sit before you and I share my heart with you and I share my pain and I share my struggle and I, I share my frustration and I even tell you, God, here's what I think would really be the best thing. Here's how it could just work out so well if you, would just, if you could just do that. I, I, I know you don't mind that. In fact, I know that you love those moments when I come to you in weakness and ask for your strength. But God, I also know how important it is that when all is said and done, that I submit to your will and I ex give you permission to say no to me. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it's right. And it has no reflection on whether you love me or not. It's no reflection on how you feel about me. You proved how you feel about me on the cross. And so right now, I just pray, not just for myself, but for everybody else here who in the past you've, had, you've said no to and it hurt and we didn't get it. I pray for everybody who in the future is going to come to that moment where they, come, they just beg you to help them and you have to say no. And I pray for those right now in the midst of the, of the pain, in the midst of the storm. And God, just show us how you can leverage our weakness for your glory. Show us how you can give us sustaining grace and be everything we need. God, help us to settle it here and now. God, for those who don't know you, and undoubtedly there are some people here that are seeking you, maybe for the first time in their life. Maybe today you give them an insight into what making you Lord means and 
And yes, it can be tough, it can be hard because we're giving you permission to say no, but at the same time, God, we're giving you, the God of the universe, permission to do what's best in our life. And we're acknowledging your love for us. So, God, I just pray that, that you'd speak into those hearts. Show them their need for you, need for a Savior in Jesus, need to be forgiven of their sin, need to have a Lord and a leader of their life, need for eternity with you. And help them recognize all they have to do is accept the gift of salvation from you. Make you their God and they become their child. Father, during this time as we sing and worship, I just pray that you'd be at work in our hearts. I know that you will. We'll do everything we can to, to focus on our relationship with you and what needs to take place there. God, you go to work in us now. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.